Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 842. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is February 6th, 2024. All right, thank you and welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. This week you're, you're being served by the infirmed. George has a little cold, I have some allergies, we're sniffling, we're coughing, but I think we'll still have a good show anyway because of the content. We've got a, a content-filled show and it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, before we get too far into the show, I need you to like this uh, uh, program. You'll see a thumbs up on YouTube or Facebook if you like the show. It's free advertising for us. Uh, if you could subscribe to the show, if you've not subscribed yet, we got a lot of new viewers uh, every week. And um, the way to be informed about a new show being uploaded is to click the subscribe button and click that bell. You will be instantly notified. I was checking my stats. Only 86% of you have the bell checked to get instantly notified. I mean, I, if I were a subscriber, I will want to be notified when there's a new episode. Okay, and the show, all 176 comments are the commenters. When this show is uh, all done, go to the comments section and give us your opinion about what's going on in the world. Uh, I think we had our most comments on last week's episode, and we re really appreciate it. We read all the comments. Uh, even some of you who I, I have to question your judgment and your comments, but that's just that's just me. George, how are you doing this week? Oh, it's great. I, I've got a cold. The... Uh, uh... February cold season has started here in Florida. The one, two of my nursing homes have shut down visitors because of this uh, latest uh, flu or whatever it's called. So my wife, I sound like I've been smoking packs of camels all night long, but uh, <laughs> that's not it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Otherwise, doing great. Yeah. I, I wake up every morning and there's a little, a little sheen of yellow pollen on the car and yeah, it's it's Florida spring here, and uh, I don't know what plant is making all that right now, but uh, it, it ends up in the in, right here in the bottom of my throat, and I have to cough, and I have some nasal stuff. But you guys didn't tune into the program to hear about our ailments. You want to know what's happening in the news. Well, we're not the only person who ails. We learned yesterday, and here this is a good news, bad news uh, story. King Charles has been diagnosed with some form of cancer. They haven't told us what it was. But that instantly knocked all the Grammy and Taylor Swift news off all the websites so they could cover King Charles. And so the good news is no more Taylor Swift or Grammy news or uh, Super Bowl news. We get to talk about King Charles and uh, the history of ailments in the family and stuff like that. And it allows us a chance to pray for the king. I mean, he's certainly the supreme, one of the governor over the church. What's the, the phrase? Uh, Supreme Governor. Yeah, of, the, of our church. So we want to keep him in our prayers. No, no, of the Church of England. Of the Church of England, not our churches. Fine, whatever. I'm Anglican of England. So uh, keep him in your prayers, please. Uh, it was interesting to, to see this come out. I even heard that uh, uh, former Prince or Prince Harry, will probably want to uh, uh, term his name, flew to England to, to meet with his father. I thought that was kind of cool. The artist formerly known as Prince has flown to see <laughs> yes. King Charles. <laughs> Prince Harry. Oh, my. Well, oh I mean, Prince Harry. Yeah. But, I mean, Prince Harry uh, obviously has been in the news with his wife the, the last five years. They left England. Uh, I don't know what's going on there. I, as a person who has a strange family, I, I feel for William and, and the king right now as they deal with a, a problem uh, child, but you know, I'm glad that this is bringing them back together, that they can uh, uh, to meet. That's kind of cool. The statement from Buckingham Palace said that the, you know, the king had gone in for a prostate procedure and while they were doing the procedure, the test revealed he had a form of cancer which was not prostate cancer, they said, but another cancer. And the Prince Charles made the decision to release <laughs> the news so as to avoid speculation on his illness and um, we were chatting beforehand and that I was saying, oh well we might have uh, two coronations within uh, a year or two and your point is Kevin and nowadays if with a 
with li with a very short list, most cancers, you have a very good chance of survivability if you get good and prompt medical care. Absolutely. And they, they said they caught this early. I mean, look at 25 years ago, leukemia uh, in childhood was, uh, 30 years ago, was had a high death rate. Uh, now mm -hmm. the death rate is in the, in the low 10s, uh, 10, 9%. That's amazing. Uh, you look at the only ones that you really, really need to be concerned with would be a, a neoblastoma, which is a, a brain tumor that uh, they haven't really got good medical care for, or pancreatic cancer and some uh, stage four melanomas. But most cancers through uh, genetic uh, treatment, through chemotherapy treatment, uh, radiation treatment, uh, if you have good health care, you will... Uh, certainly uh, be able to uh, have many years. And we saw this with the uh, 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 bishop. He was um, uh, Bishop Quasi, sorry. <laughs> ben Quasi with ben his Quasi, colon yeah, catcher, yeah. yes. Had colon catcher, stage four, was treated and goes on to live and, and uh, preach the gospel. And that's just a, uh, an amazing well, thing in today's day and age. Well, he lived, frankly, because Bishop Quig Lawrence uh, brought him over to the United States uh, to Roanoke, Virginia, to receive top-flight uh, medical the care, which, yep. which really is, uh, that degree of medical care really isn't available in, in most of the rest of the, de in the developing world. No, not at all. So, all right, keep King Charles in your prayers, and let's move on to our next story. I completely lost that web page. Hold on one second. I apologize to my audience. Um, the war in Ukraine Just has been going. Yeah, <laughs> I got it right here. The war, in the the war in Ukraine has been going on now for uh, a couple years, and Justin Welby is heading to Ukraine, and um, he wants to show his support for Ukraine. Uh, He's picking sides, obviously. He is how ready. But it's interesting that he still has this desire uh, to preach freedom, to preach the end of war, to preach peace. I support that, you know. Well, the tricky walk for Justin Welby is not tying himself to the Zelensky <clears throat> regime, yeah. but to the sufferings of the Ukrainian people. The, the, the Zelensky regime is... Uh, uh, they just murdered an American journalist, uh, Gonzalo Lira, who was in prison uh, in uh, Ukraine for criticizing Zelensky's regime. Uh, the religious leaders who do not support the Zelensky regime are beaten up, arrested. They've uh, canceled elections. There's massive corruption taking place. And the Zelensky regime is basically calling up young boys and old men uh, to serve as cannon fodder in this never-ending war against Russia. So, is Justin Welby going to back Zelensky, or is he going to pray for the Ukrainian people? It's a fine line to walk. It is, because... because early on, he bought hook, line, and sinker, all the Zelensky mythology, which, to be fair, the, the U.S. and British media were just recycling uh, from well, the propaganda offices. Well, to, to be fair, enemy of our enemy is our friend. Uh, mm -hmm. The Soviet Union, now dissolved into uh, Russia, a single state, is still the enemy of uh, North America and the enemy of capitalism. And it's now a friend of North Korea and a friend of China. Uh, enemy of our enemy is our friend. And uh, we see a lot of victimhood happening in Ukraine. Because we could, the people suffered under Lewinsky or under their leader, and now they're suffering under the invasion. So, uh, people suffer when uh, uh, there's corruption. Now, it's kind of the worst of two. Who is worse, Putin or the current leader of, of the Ukraine? Uh, I would say the current uh, uh, Putin is worse, but not by much. No. Yeah. All right, so. Let's go on to our next story. Uh, how long is he going to be there, George? Five days. Okay, five days. All right. Uh, we're going to do some UK news. There's a lot of uh, Church of England news. Uh, the UK safeguarding officers are meeting this week to take up a complaint. And I don't know if I had this right. 
about Archbishop Justin Welby and Archbishop Contrell this week. What's going on? Well, it's an interesting story that uh, we've been given, I've been given copies of correspondence between safeguarding officers and some complainants. Uh, a group of victims uh, who have been uh, left high and dry by the safeguarding process in the Church of England. This has all been laid out in the Wilkinson report. And there's a recent report by Professor Glasgow uh, who uh, has said, you know, that the way the Church of England has handled this has basically caused immense psychological harm to the victims. Well, a safeguarding complaint has been filed against the members of the Archbishop's Council for basically covering up and in action over the abuse problems. Take Justin Welby. Uh, he is uh, known about, he knew about John, uh, John Smythe. Smythe yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. long before mm -hmm. any action or public knowledge was made due to his uh, uh, affiliation with the boys' uh, bash camps. And the safeguarding officers of Canterbury Diocese and a number of dioceses are meeting today to discuss uh, these allegations. Now, you know, trying to write this story up is difficult because when you ask the safeguarding people, they can't tell you anything because they're not allowed to. So I contacted a member of the Archbishop's Council, and he said, no, I've not heard about any of this stuff. But he said, I really don't think this is going to go anywhere because there are so many conflicting stories, so many complaints. We've had so many studies <clears throat> that uh, the safeguarding people will just be another uh, committee looking at the same issue. And at the end of the day, uh, they'll sort of finally grind something out. Now, as you and I were discussing before the show, the problem for, say, the Canterbury safeguarding officer is that he works for Justin Welby. Yes. And, you know, <clears throat> he's not independent. And this, is pro this has been the whole problem of the safeguarding process, that there is no independence. There is no uh, action. One, one of the things that the British government had, the ICS, I think, Independent Investigation yeah. into Child Sexual Abuse, Institu yep, yep. Independent institutional, whatever it is, yeah. ICSA, I I C S A, <laughs> and that was over a year and a half, two years ago, and they had seven major recommendations, including mandatory rec mandatory reporting requirements, as we have in the United States. In other words, if I am made aware of child abuse in the state of Florida or elder abuse, I have no discretion. I must immediately contact Child and Family Services, plus the diocese plus the insurance company in New York. I, I can't, in other words, if I can't pastorally try to resolve this, which is an aside, is what would seem to be the issue up in uh, the Diocese of the Upper Midwest, well, that they didn't that authority is follow. Taken away. That authority is taken that away. That authority is taken away. I must do this. Mm -hmm. Well, after the, gov the British government, the conservative government, has not uh, implemented almost any of the ICSA recommendations. So the issue is, this meeting is taking place today. I can't get any formal comments, and those who would be the target aren't particularly worried because there's so much crap going on that which committee is next going to look at this? Yeah. But at the end of the day, the whole, f that there is even this issue is a blot upon the reputation of the Church of England, that it again and again and again it comes back to protecting uh the people in authority and power and that there's no accountability that uh certain people can be disciplined as a show trial the former bishop of lincoln was hammered and suspended by justin welby for relatively minor things while the bishop of oxford who did much worse things is left free and clear Johnson Tamu, who was on sort of a second level uh, person in this. In other words, he knew about the bad acts of the Bishop of Oxford in not acting. And Stephen Cottrell, when he was a suffragette, when he was an area bishop in the Diocese of Oxford, you know, these guys, you know, St. Tamu gets hammered, Cottrell and Welby are left alone. Um, there's no consistency. Well, I and think that. 
the biggest failure here is the the victims have no voice in the church. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't care if you meet with safeguarding committees. I don't care that you found guilty parties. But when you silence the victims, that's the greatest crime. When you ignore their complaints, when you uh, finally take their complaints up and kind of hide it under a pile of papers on your desk or have little secret safeguarding meetings and it, there's never any accountability, the, the shame that that brings on the, the Church of England and other churches who've done this in the past, it, it's crazy, George, to see this. We need to, I, I'm not starting a Me Too moment here, but we need to listen to the voices of these victims who've been completely hidden in silence by the Church of England. You know, in some ways, the continuing, ignoring, continuing to ignore and marginalize the victims, in some ways, perpetu perpetuates the abuse mm -hmm. that they've had in the past. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I found my story page here. <coughs> <clears throat> no, that's right. I went, hey, we're between stories. <clears throat> there. Got it covered. Living love and faith may be over, dot, 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 for now. Uh, nobody seems to be in charge over there, George. We hear stories about uh, anger in the liberal uh, side of things. We hear stories about the conservatives have a hollow victory. And as usual, uh, as happened here in the Episcopal Church, it's going to happen anyway whether or not anybody's in charge of the chaos. We reported a few weeks ago that Martin Snow, Bishop of Leicester, and Helen Ann Hartley, the Bishop of Newcastle, were now the bishops appointed to take over the LLF process. Um, Justin Welby uh, stopped the process so that standalone uh, services could not take place until pastoral guidelines have been written. And those pastoral guidelines would include something like a third province, structural differentiation for traditionalists. So the liberals blew up. The liberals blew up in anger because General Synod specifically rejected structural differentiation, very close vote, but they rejected it. And they asked the Church of England to move forward immediately on standalone services. Well, we said, no, we're gonna stop all that. Uh, it hasn't stopped people, by the way. Uh, Beverly Minster, which is uh, a very nice pair, a uh, very nice Minster church, um, which is under the patronage of the Church <clears throat> Reformation of uh, the Church Society and the Reformation Trust, just celebrated a standalone gay wedding, not this past Saturday, but the Saturday before. So it's happening. It's even happening in churches under the patronage of the Church Society. I think they should sort of check into that, but it shouldn't happen. So it's been stopped, and the liberals are screaming bloody murder because Welby has defied the will of General <clears throat> Senate on this issue. Then a new theological advisor to the House of Bishops was appointed an interim post for six months because the old theological advisor had left to become the dean of Ridley Hall, a, th a theological college in Cambridge. Well, the new fellow is named Tom Wolford. He's a young fellow who is uh, a, teaches at the Emmanuel Theological College up in the northwest uh, of England as a parish priest. And he's conservative, and he's a member of General Synod, and he's been vociferous in his opposition to LLF. Well, the liberals blew a gasket. They just, it was horrible. You know, how could this conservative now be the one advising the bishops? Well, then Helen Ann Hartley dropped uh, a monkey wrench into this, or a spanner, I guess the English would say, by saying, I'm resigning from LLF. <laughs> and the initial response was, she's resigning because a conservative has been appointed. But in her letter to the uh, archbishops, she said, I'm resigning because nobody asked, nobody consulted with me on this process. Who, You've appointed who would, conservative. Who would be my maybe advisor? Fine, but nobody asked yeah. me. No, nobody asked me, you appointed a person who's going to be my advisor, and nobody asked me. Yes. That's a valid point. And so she, she may have been opposed to this man theologically, mm. but I but the strength of her letter was pointed at, you know, the process is broken. Martin Snow, 
uh, the other bishop wrote a letter saying, yes, I'm staying, but I'll stay if the process is made transparent and I'm involved in the process. And so he was allowed to choose a second theological advisor. So they now have a liberal theological advisor plus a conservative theological advisor for the next six months. Uh, and so LLF <clears throat> has lost the trust, the LLF process has lost the trust of the liberal majority, slim liberal majority. There are some conservatives like Tom Wolford who are willing to work with the process thinking they can work within the system to achieve an end they want. And then there are other conservatives who say, you know, Tom is just going to be rolled. He's young. He is a bit naive. And he's just going to be used to achieve Welby's greater end. Um, see, the the uh, what I have read and what I have seen is that David Ken and David Porter, who has been Welby's uh, consigliere all these years, has taken the Northern Ireland approach. If we can get the uh, Sinn Féin, the IRA, and the and the uh, <clears throat> Uh, the Unionist uh, yep. Party, uh, the, the the Loyalists, to form a government and work together and keep Northern Ireland relatively calm, then we should be able to get the pro and the anti uh, gay people in the Church of England together. And unfortunately, that that political analogy just doesn't quite work. No. Well... It hasn't worked so far. We'll see what happens with the Church of England. No, I think it's a, it's a, it's set up for another failure. But I think the biggest point we want to make here is this isn't going to stop it. This is going to break out in churches around the Church of England uh, and the UK. Uh, it's going to happen anyway. When yeah, I mean, uh, as, when, when as, conservatives <coughs> try to oppose uh, things <coughs> happening in the Episcopal Church in the 1970s, it happened anyway. You know? Yeah, and. We're seeing it pop up in unexpected places. Beverly Minster, as I mentioned, right. Right. should be a conservative parish. Yet there, if you look at Facebook, you see the two men dressed alike in morning coats and top hats. Right. They're either a vaudeville act that found the wrong, that moved off stage, or they're two men getting married in a standalone service. Um, in in your in Yorkshire, uh, so there's anarchy, anarchy yeah, on right. several levels. Okay, and there's uh, no enforcement. There's no. It's, this is what the thing in the Episcopal Church was. There's no enforcement, or no discipline of bad behavior. The only discipline is if you say, if you call people names, if you call if you oppose women priests and you say they're priestesses, you'll get hammered from the hot from the highest high type uh, housetop for being rude and nasty. But if you perform a same sex uh, blessing without permission no problem not at all all right so we got one last uk story to finish up with uh, i don't know these names at all this is before i became involved in journalism uh there's somebody named chris brain from the uh, charismatic movement in the church of england and he's been indicted by the uk for kind of pulling a, a jimmy swagger you know type thing here george <laughs> More, more of a, yeah, Jimmy Swaggart or more of a Jim Baker type Baker. thing. Okay, yeah, sure. In the nineteen late eighties, early nineties, in Sheffield, there was this service that called the nine o'clock service. It was one of the first manifestations of a powerful, charismatic service, and the Church of England was really excited because you know, hundreds of people, maybe a thousand people, would come to a to this worship service led by this charismatic minister named Chris Brain, Church of England Parish. Well, it eventually all broke up in acrimony uh, with, with accusations that it become cult-like. And now the uh, Yorkshire police, South Yorkshire, whoever police, Same thing, yeah. um, have filed 34 charges, including one rape and 33 sexual harassment assault against Chris Brain for assaulting women, you know, sexually abusing and using spiritual abuse to basically make them into his little playthings. And at the same time, the uh, 
uh, the Mike Pilavachi affair is unfolding where the, the King's counsel, the lawyer who is conducting the investigation on behalf of sole survivor Watford is asking victims to come forward to give their testimony. So I would say the two most prominent, the two most recognized uh, charismatic, uh, parish leaders, Chris Brain and Mike Pelavacci in the Church of England in the last 30, 40 years are both going, uh, one's before the police and the other's before the lawyers. And man, this is just bad, bad news for the church. I mean, I just have to stop and ask myself, what has Satan been up to? Okay. I mean, these, Mike Pilavachi and Chris Brain all started out with the best of motives. Mm -hmm. But when they became successful, and then they became powerful, then in then the snake crept into the Garden of Eden, and each turned them into sexual predators. Well, w when they became above reproach, when you bring in money and you bring in allegedly, fame, allegedly, we oh, have yeah, not I'm been just, convicted. <laughs> well, allegedly, they're they're allegedly. from the UK. We're, 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 we're kind of safe there. They can't sue us from the UK, but. The reality is when you become above reproach, which happened with Jim and Tammy and Jimmy, uh, you're, you become untouchable and you're allowed to do things uh, that are beyond accounting, which are beyond church authority, which is beyond reason. And it brings such shame, not just to your Church of England, not just to the Anglican Church, but to Christianity itself. You know, to the very gospel, you're shaming the gospel uh, because you're showing that it's not transparent, not transformative, not life changing. But you're just one of the one of the the enemies out there of the gospel. And it, it's sad to say that, but uh, when you become uh, beyond reproach, you become an enemy of the gospel. Yeah. Well, you know, Saint Benedict tells us. Uh, you know, look for God in all things. And perhaps this is God's way of just cleansing the Church of England because I don't think there's any particular stream of churchmanship or party that has not now been tainted by scandal, yeah. whether it's sexual scandal or some other sort of scandal. Um, nobody's hands are clean as a party. Individuals are clean. But sure. if, if we say, you know, look at us, you know, you did, well, People would say at the beginning of the ACNA, look at us, we've never had a sex scandal or a bad bishop. Well, then wait a few years and you've had some bishops kicked out because they were problem with pornography and this and that and the other. Well, or they were kicked out, be, but they were kicked out because we have accountability. Yeah. You know, and. But, but there are no pure institutions as I, as I think that I'm trying to no, say. I, absolutely. And I don't think there ever will be. You know, there, there's uh, all except for Shepherd of the Hills Episcopal Church in the Canton, <laughs> Florida. Anglican TV, of course, but you know, no, I agree. I, you know, so let's move on to news. Uh, I, some of you have been patiently waiting for 28 minutes for us to talk about the Calvin Robinson mere Anglicism affair scandal, whatever. And uh, we have an update, uh, as we reported in our last show um, with uh, Bishop Alex Far uh, Farmer here in the, the Diocese of the Gulf Atlantic, had mentioned in a sermon that Calvin Robinson has, um, I, what's the wording he used, George? Because I don't want to uh, get Been led astray he by a He's demonic. got a spirit, yeah, demonic. And so uh, <coughs> let's back this up. George Conger, the Reverend George Conger, could teach a doctorate level course on patience. You were struck many years ago after surgery, uh, completely paralyzed in a hospital, and you you had the patience to get through it. Uh, you never called Kevin and said, "This is horrible. I don't. I can't stand being paralyzed." You know, I never. You you, you were patient through it. Kudos. I could teach a doctorate level course on forgiveness. Um, God has put me in the place where I've had to forgive um, things that uh, I should not have to have to forgive. Uh, Bishop Alex Farmer has found him in a situation where he had to ask forgiveness and apologize uh, for 
something that when I watch the apology, I'm like, you know, he could teach a doctorate level course on apologizing. He he kind of nailed it here, George. Yes, Bishop Farmer um, did not respond to any press queries on this <laughs> point or private queries that would then be Nothing. later reprinted on Facebook. Yeah, He responded by taking the bull squarely head on by the horns and issuing an apology for his intemperate remarks. Yeah. The problem I see is not with Bishop Farmer, but the reaction to Bishop Farmer's initial remarks by cler by some who were clergy were so over the top. Many who were clergy. A and yeah. so without love or charity or or patience or understanding. Um, now, many who but, are not, uh, and let me back, many who are not in the Anglican Church as well. We have comments from people in our comment section regarding this issue of the, of the last two or three episodes, which were so unkind, which were so, uh, what God do you serve? You know, I, I it surprised me sometimes, and, and some of them were Anglican clergy as well. And I'm like, what God are you serving with this comment? Well, yeah. So the the Robinson affair on one level has sort of petered out because um, the target for those who are angry was Alex Farmer, mm -hmm. and he's sort of nipped that in the bud. But now we're sort of seeing a second level where. People are now predicting that the imminent demise of the ACNA over the women's issue. Mm -hmm. There's, they're essentially trying to grab this uh, contretemps and use it to reshape the church in the image they would like to see. Um, we've been posting some of these on both sides. And one of the, th you know, some people are criticizing Calvin Robinson by mm -hmm. saying, look, mere Anglicanism. This man, Calvin, is not an Anglican. He doesn't believe in justification by faith. He doesn't follow the 39 articles. So he, he, you know, he thinks the Reformation is a mistake and so on and so forth. Not even to mention his beliefs in Mary, you know. Yeah. So. And so that, you know, good for him in his political fight against wokeness. But realize this is somebody, you know, you need, you should have done your homework to realize this is not somebody who would walk into a South Carolina evangelical crowd and be able to play patty cake and agree on everything. And then you have other people by saying that, well, now uh, the curtains are down. We can see the evil machinations of the pro women people who will instantly silence you if you disagree. And they're basically saying, now is the time for war. Well, I don't think any of this is going to play out because the leaders and the bishops of the ACNA and the senior clergy have the, I, I believe they have the wisdom and the spiritual uh, sight to see that now is not the time to form a circular firing squad and liquidate our enemies but rather to stand fast for the gospel in a, in a broken and horrible world. Yeah. We do sometimes lose the main point uh, in, our, in our fights within the church. And this kind of uh, highlights one of them. Uh, I get it's a, it's a hard issue. Uh, depending where you fall on it. And it's and, uh, to many people, including myself, it's an issue worth fighting for, but not for the sake of the gospel. I'm not going to lose the sake of the gospel over the fight. I'm not going to lose mm -hmm. uh, the fight for what the ACNA is doing right now for the, the sake of this argument. Um, and especially coming up months away from the ACNA picking a new archbishop. You know, uh, now I want people to 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 back up a little because in picking the Archbishop of Canterbury, they've pretty much gone uh, traditional evangelical, traditional evangelical over time as to who they're, they're, they they pick. They, they don't pick the same breed of Archbishop every time. 
And I would say that the ACNA may be doing the same in the future, where Archbishop Duncan was uh, pro-women's orders, Archbishop Foley was not pro-women's uh, uh, in, in the uh, priesthood. He would He's okay with deacons. Um, and maybe the next archbishop will be pro-women's women's orders again. You know, you have to watch for this, you know, kind of tied back and forth within the ACNA. And how are you going to, re to react to that? Well, we're going to go change the Constitution. That's a, that's a big take because you need two-thirds uh, of the, the bishop's support and laity support to, to even get to that point where you can talk about the Constitution. It's not something you're going to just uh, willy-nilly change overnight. Understand, Kevin, I know it's a hard issue, but I'm not going to disgrace the gospel uh, destroying a church over it. Oh, but the church is destroyed without the issue. Uh, not really, you know. Well, it for those that this is the paramount issue, I have sympathy for them. I do, absolutely. But I don't share that concern. For me, uh, in my, for me, I'm driven pastorally, and that may be considered uh, intellectual weakness or lack of moral character. But I'm driven pastorally. For me, uh, in one of in my confirmation class, I have a 12 year old girl whose mother died of a fentanyl overdose. Parents are separated. Mother was a weekend chipper. Meaning she'd inject yeah. heroin under the skin. She wasn't an addict addict. She held down a job and all this and that. But she got a bad dose of heroin that had fentanyl in it. Um, my daughter sent me a clipping from San Francisco where she lives. And it was just to note that there are 24,500 addicts, injecting addicts, registered with the Department of Health in the San Francisco. But there are only 16,000 students in the San Francisco High School District. So there are almost not quite twice as many addicts as high school students in San Francisco. For me, the crisis, the other little crisis, we had a boy in my, we have a boy, he's 17, uh, he's white. He was beaten up by six black kids at, at high school where they were they're playing the knockout game where somebody came up from behind him and okay. sucker punched him in the back of the head. For me, race relations. Uh, which were not this bad 10 years ago. I blame Barack Obama myself, but the race summer. relation, yeah. uh, the drug crisis, these have more uh, import in my daily life because I quite clearly, I hate to say this, feel, see the impact of Satan seeking to destroy our country and our society through this so that the issues that we've not been able to sort of solve over 500 years in other words what happens at the eucharist or 50 years whether women or not should be priest i'm not saying they're unimportant but for me what is more pressing are the things that are destroying my people if you will yeah. racism narcotics uh, a collapsing economy the disappearance of the middle class the impoverishment of people yeah it's it's hard to watch the church losing ground with the culture war that's happening around us. Uh, the West is falling very quickly. And le le left unsupervised, just watch, left unsupervised, children can be convinced to cut off their genitals. Where is the church? We should be fighting this. I, I don't hear any church fighting this at the at the political level you know and well the episcopal church capitulated at their last oh, general convention yeah, absolutely and so you know left unsupervised this gen we're losing a generation um the first country in all around the world that bans social media for those under 18 wins you will regain your generation you will regain the youngest lost generation because they won't be online comparing themselves to everybody else. They won't be completely disillusioned with what uh, a false world looks like. And um, 
I, I recommend it for the U.S. I was watching uh, a program last night on, on Fox where they interviewed a guy who had the answer. All we need to do is limit the kids to social media and have a different social media for them. No! <laughs> That's social media is the problem. It takes up their time. They don't have any free time to go out and play, to play with their friends, to you know, to to sit down well, and think and be bored. You know, it's 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 like the advocates of gun control. Huh? If we only make it illegal, then we'll have these shootings stopped. Yeah, sure. Well, guns are already not allowed in schools, yeah. but you know, one of my with the on the internet and social media one of the problems i had to deal i have have had to deal with is little boys who go to school via the internet during covid mm -hmm. when class is over they turn on and watch pornography and they are having their views of male female relationships not shaped by their parents not shaped by their culture not shaped by love but by pornography girls want this to be done to them which is not true. And so weaning children off of pornography, it's illegal um, to, yeah. you know, for the 18 year olds to watch it. It's against the law, but they can do it anyway. And I need and, to, let, let's dissolve the concept of 70s pornography. This is not mm -hmm. Playboy magazine or whatever else was available back then. This is violent porn they're watching. This is where women are assaulted and slapped, and uh, you know it, it's not the pictures of the '70s. This is a whole different generation of boys being brought up to understand that women are sub in sexual relationships, that, and uh, it's not reality at all. It certainly doesn't show love. It doesn't show passion. It doesn't show anything that we understand. Uh, as Christians in sexuality, it shows violence you know, and, and and subjugating women. You know, forget the arguments about women priests of complementarianism and all this and that. When we're raising a generation of young boys who view women as objects, yeah, uh, it's you know we, we just are so disconnected sometimes in our church fights from the out reality in which we live. Yeah, well, we live in a world now is certainly in western cities like san francisco where drugs are not illegal and mm -hmm. petty crime uh mr beater crime is no longer uh fought or prosecuted uh, you have to get pretty felonious to to finally uh raise the eye and eyebrow of a, a prosecutor here in new york city we had uh three and i need to use the word because people aren't using it illegal immigrants uh four illegal immigrants attacked two police officers they were arrested taken to the police station and let go uh because nobody wanted to prosecute them interesting enough in that dist that the that police district moments after they were released it went over the police radios and all the police cars in that district went out had their sirens going because they're so mad you know but i mean why would i be a police officer if i'm trying to the, the job of a police officer is not to enforce the law. It's to uh, let the judge and the court system enforce the law. It's to protect society and to take it, a criminal. Do you remember but, Adam 12? The side oh, of yeah. the police car said to protect and, protect and serve. serve. Yeah. And uh, it, we've lost it all. You mentioned Barack Obama is at fault. And I, I think two things, which were minor and major at the time, have really throwing our nation in, in a qualm. One was the beer summit where Barack Obama invited uh, a professor who was arrested by a cop uh, um, in, a, in a misunderstanding to the White House to have a beer summit. Barack Obama basically said cops should not do anything uh, uh, in their power uh, and allow the courts to do what they do. Uh, and it, it was just a whole misconception of what law and order really is. But we had the beer summit. The second is when the Supreme Court in 2015 said we should allow for um, same-sex marriage. It completely redefined what um, our government needs to promote in marriage, in families. In uh, it's such a mess out there. And I I point to those two two things: one with law and order, and what with it, what it means to 
promote family in a society. George, we're at 44 minutes, so we've got two or three more news stories to talk about here. Um, and I knew this was not going to end well. Uh, before we do Mexico, let's do the, the, the <coughs> Nigerian... The, <coughs> excuse me. Hey, between stories. <coughs> Good. Uh, the Nigerian update. Uh, Bishop K from the Diocese of... Anglican Diocese of the Trinity, which, if you thought was dissolved, has not really dissolved yet. Uh, boy, where do we start with the story? Let's back up. Tell us a little bit about the Anglican Diocese of the Trinity, which we thought was dissolved, George. Last fall, the uh, Council of Bishops the, uh, of the Church of Nigeria dissolved the Anglican Diocese of the Trinity, turning it into a missionary district of the Church which, of Nigeria. Which was a diocese here in North America. The United States. Yeah. It, had a, it was a legal entity, uh, was a bona fide diocese of Nigeria. Earlier in the year, uh, the diocese, which had been led by Bishop Felix Orgy, they went over to the Anglican Church in North America. So those who chose to remain were in the Anglican Diocese of the Trinity, which was a Nigerian-led, ruled, governed diocese of primarily Nigerian congregations across the United States and Canada. Well, the Anglican, the Church of Nigeria has decided to reorganize their North American presence after conversations with Foley Beach about two Anglican jurisdictions in one spot. Right. So the and this had been a sore point between the two and. That's one of the reasons why Felix Orgy, who is of Nigerian heritage, moved over to the ACNA. He's an American citizen. I believe he's an American citizen. Sure. Or he might be a Canadian citizen. He's a citizen. citizen. He's, uh, <laughs> Somewhere. he's a Westerner. <laughs> Update us in the uh, comments so we know. <laughs> all right. And so that, uh, well, it's the natural progression over time of the, the, the of these, uh, national churches sort of forming into a new group. Well, Bishop K didn't go quietly and was arguing about this. And so the Church of Nigeria suspended him for disobedience. Then lay leaders of the Anglican Diocese, the Trinity, filed a lawsuit in Indiana Civil Court because the Anglican Diocese of the Trinity is domiciled in Indiana. And they got a judge to rule that the Constitution and canons of the Diocese of the Trinity did not allow the Church of Nigeria to shut them down. It had to follow certain corporate rules that govern American corporations. So we're now in a position where the Anglican Diocese of the Trinity, which is at the lay people argue, we got no money from Nigeria, we got you know, only clergy and leaders, and but we've paid for these buildings, we pay for these clergy, and we're not going to be shut down by these, Niger you know, by these people over in Nigeria, you know, without our involvement in the discussions. And okay. meanwhile, the bishop has been suspended, and if he in gets involved on the lay people's side, he'll be kicked out of the ministry, and then will we have a new denomination in the United States? I was going to say, we now have a diocese without a province. Mm -hmm. Because as far as Nigeria is concerned, it's dissolved. Even though they lost mm -hmm. in court, uh, it was voted to dissolve, it's been dissolved. Um, and so we have a diocese without a province, without a, a primate. What what could go wrong, George? <laughs> well. Well, one of the things is that the lay leaders of the uh, Anglican Diocese of the Trinity are pretty top-flight people. Yes, they are. Because there are a number of Nigerian professional. Nigerians have done very well in the United States as immigrants in the last generation. One of the, uh, one of the leaders had an editorial. He's a professor, I think, of physics at Harvard. Um, some doctors, lawyers, professors. These aren't... Uh, small town shopkeepers these are educated intelligent people who don't take kindly to be being bossed around by overseas bishops so it, it'll be interesting to see how this thing unfolds but right now we're at stalemate where the institution survives independently under law but the bishop and the clergy are under some sort of uh, interdiction and how will they jump who pays their salary? Who pays the salary? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, some bishops uh, 
uh, including Bishop Orgy, dodged a bullet by certainly joining the ACNA uh, before this, this diocese went into a, a chaotic time. So uh, congratulations for coming over. Our last story. Uh, listen, if you're Catholic, Roman Catholic, I want you to put your seatbelt on, um, sit down. Uh, if you've recently uh, joined the Roman Catholic Church, leaving the Anglican Church, this is a good time to maybe get a drink, come back here and sit down. We're going to talk about something pretty important. The, oops, who's calling me here? No, no, I'm not going to take a call from my dentist. No way. Not now. Um, so the Council of Cardinals is meeting in the Vatican, and they got nothing better to do, I guess. They are calling some people who are experts on women clergy and women in the episcopacy over to consult them or to, to talk to them. And it's interesting who they're inviting over, and it's interesting that this is a topic with the uh, Council of Cardinals in the Vatican and what may happen in the near future. Uh, so, George, who did they invite over? Well, they have invited oh, I lost at audio. the College of so, Cardinal meeting. Yeah. And you can look at the photos from the Vatican News, but they don't really say anything in the Vatican News. There's a woman wearing a purple shirt in the meetings, and her name is Joe Bailey Wells. And she I know had her. been... She had been a uh, an area bishop in the Church of England, and then she was appointed uh, to an administrative job. And then from another administrative job, she was made bishop to the bishops, working for the Anglican Consultative Council, basically in a uh, administrative uh, job. And she is, along with two Catholic lay, two uh, I think a religious and a lay woman, are talking to the cardinals about the role of women in ministry. Um, well, I'm going to be facetious. I'm glad we're sending our best. Yes, we're sending uh, our best. <laughs> oh my. Um, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you want to answer the question. And, and I'm speaking specifically about the Church of England, whether or not uh, allowing for women in uh, clerical orders worked or not. I would tend to, in my humble opinion, say it probably didn't work in the Church of England. Um, just not to say there's not wonderful women in ministry in the priesthood there, but at some point they let out a lie. And, it, and I don't think this is the women's fault. I think this is the guy's fault when they let in women, they said there'll be mutual flourishing. This can work both ways. And it can't, George. Not there. Well, I have a, I, ha I must admit to a uh, personal uh, opinion here. Of course, it's personal opinion. <laughs> uh, I, I, as an undergraduate, went to Duke University, yeah. and I played lacrosse. And those of a certain age remember the, may remember the Duke lacrosse crisis. Oh, where, my Lord, yes. Yeah, recent, actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, this is 10, 15 years after I was there. Yeah, Joe Bailey Wells was the Episcopal chaplain at Duke University at the time, mm -hmm. and her husband was the chaplain of the university. And they basically jumped whole hog into guilty and proven innocent that uh, believe, you know, all, women must be believed. Me too. You know, the first yeah. of the Me Too things. And yeah. of course, later, it all turned out to be a lie and a fraud. And the prosecutor, uh, Durham uh, prosecutor who pushed this was later disbarred because yeah. uh, he knew it was a lie from the very beginning. And uh, her judgment wasn't sound way back when, you know. And now she's, rep now she's trying to share to the Catholic Church why they should have women clergy. Well, if you're a conservative Catholic and an op 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 opponent of women's orders, you have nothing to worry about. Yeah. No, I don't no, think this is this yeah. is not the person to make the case. <laughs> this is not the droid you're looking for. All right, quickly, uh, last update is going to be Mexico. Uh, the joke at, at the end of most <coughs> programs here at Anglican Unscripted is, oh, George still has some more Indian corruption stories. Sadly, corruption does exist in our church, not just in India, uh, but in provinces around the world. And we're seeing a kind of a a sad situation uh, developing and occurring in Mexico. Uh, George, bring us up to speed and uh, let us know the names. 
there are now there's a schism in the Anglican Church of Mexico, right. and that it's over the diocese of northern Mexico and the primate there, uh, Bishop uh, Tr Enrique Trevino. There is uh, accusations that that his the election was procured fraudulently. In other words, uh, people who voted shouldn't have voted, and votes were. You know, voting, your counting stopped at midnight, and the next morning uh, he had 100,000 more votes yeah, when there were only uh, 15 clergy, that sort of thing. And it's led to the former primate, um, Francisco Moreno, and the bishop of southeastern Mexico, Julio Martin, and uh, Enrique, is it Gomez? Ricardo Gomez, the bishop of western Mexico. So I'm southeastern wrote, Mexico. I'm which, glad you wrote these down because. <laughs> the, well, I've got my little southeastern Mexico, which is Yucatan all the way down. Yeah. Western Mexico, which is Acapulco all the way up, sort of the modern half. Um, and then there's have basically say, at, have made joined with the former primate to say, no, this is wrong. This is corrupt. This is criminal. And they've gotten the standing committee of the Anglican Church of Mexico to repudiate the election of the bishop and of the new primate, Trevino. Well, Trevino was hit back using Mexican law to say that they can't do this. And so now we have rival primates and a divided church. Now, Mexico, in the, in the when I started writing for the living church uh, in the 90s, uh, no, uh, late 90s, the Anglican Church of Mexico, which had only recently gotten its uh, independence from the Episcopal Church of the USA, was a byword for corruption. Yes. In other words, I would talk to people at A15 who were responsible because over some years we were to give them money to support them as they went aside. And the money would, a lot of the money was stolen. Some bishops were worse than other bishops in being crooks. Now, how could that happen? Well, Mexico, because of their revolution, I think in 1910, has very severe anti-clerical laws. Until recently, you could not walk around wearing clerical collar, anybody, right. Catholics and whatnot. Correct. And, there were, and religious organizations were not allowed to own property. So the parishes, the, parish, the, the bank accounts and the buildings and assets of Mexican churches, all churches, were vested in their bishops or leaders. Now, if you have an organization like the Catholic Church with lots of rules and checks and balances and this and that, you know, you can keep it pretty clean. With the Episcopal Anglican Church of Mexico, if you've got a bad bishop and he controls the property and the bank accounts and he pays the salaries of his clergy, it's a license to steal. And some did. And so there's accusations that the new election was basically bought. Uh by spending church funds. And how this will settle out, I have no clue. Uh, now, I do know, as a Facebook friend, Bishop Martin, he served for 20 odd years in Canada and took a massive pay cut to be a bishop in southeastern Mexico, by the way. Yeah. Um, to go down there, he's <clears throat> clean. And he is really working to reform and uh, evangelize that part of Mexico. So I, just based on not. Not a knowledge of the facts, but a knowledge of the people. I'm inclined to believe Bishop Martin and company. But friends, um, the Diocese of the Southwest in the ACNA is one of the faster growing dioceses in the ACNA. And the reason is that their growth is taking place in Mexico. Yeah. A lot of their growth. They have parishes from Monterey. I don't know how far south they go, but they have a lot of, they have, they're growing parishes because they're not tied into this whole fiasco of the Anglican Church of Mexico. <laughs> now, if you're in the if you're in the diocese of the Southwest, in comments, tell me, have I got this totally wrong? Yeah, let, or uh, well, but that's the cool thing about our audience, George. They do point out our inaccuracies, uh, and we like that. I mean, when you're right about us being wrong, we like that. When you're wrong about us being wrong, we're patient people. George could be a doctorate teacher in that. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 842 of Anglican Unscripted.